much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up When it looks 
The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it cast. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care.
song it will be out of the darkness we will rise and Good morning, everybody. How we doing? Super. Good. I hear a super and I hear a... How we doing? Good. That's better. That's better. Good is the correct answer, right? We're, we're, we're keep it real here. Just kidding. No. No. All right. Hey, thank you so much for being here. My name is Jason Quaring. I'm one of the pastors here. My, my co-pastor, Drew, is, is with all of our junior hires, uh, most of our junior hires up at, at a retreat this weekend. So, so I'm stuck doing announcements, which is his job. So there we go. I would much rather do announcements than spend a weekend with junior hires. Uh, I, I, I used to do that all the time, and there you go. And look what happened. So there you go. So, so there you go. Hey, uh, we are here to grow disciples who love God, love people, and serve the world. That is who we are. That is what we do. That is, is everything about us. And so um, we pray that that is a reality in your lives. If, if you are new here, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, if, if, uh, if you want, grab a mug downstairs. I think we still have some of the new mugs down there. So, and I think Drew mentioned this, if you just want a new mug, but you already have some greenhouse mugs, just 10 bucks. Come on, help us out. There you go a little bit. So, um, but anyhow, um, if you're new, if you are not getting greenhouse uh, text updates, I do it maybe once a week ish. Um, if you're not getting those and you want to just let me know, uh, talk to me personally, or you can get on the website and, uh, send us a contact us, um, email and give us your information on that. We won't sell it to any third parties or anything like that. So, all right. So a couple things we have going on. This is kind of our family time where we can talk about what's going on in the life of our family. First of all, you'll notice we don't have a lot of junior hires today because they are at the fall retreat. And so Drew sent me a picture. We've had some great leaders, some of which are even here this morning. So we got rock wall climbing. We got some great worship. They have a fun lake. This is kind of up by Wan Ship, um, just past um, Park City up there, fun Christian camp up there. So uh, they had to be freezing, had some meal time, um, some volleyball. What else we got? Some swimming there. 
What else do we have here? Okay, playing with rattlesnakes, that's always fun. Um, who's the, who's that, who is that all red kid there that's playing that? <laughs> and then, and then go back to that other one there. Um, the, the upside down thing, that is just vomiting right there. I don't know how they do that. Junior hires amaze me. So, so there you go. I wish I could show that one in, in motion there, but, uh, what's the next one we got? We got our fearless, uh, leader Drew right there, given his talk. And uh, he talked yesterday morning, and then they have a, they have a friendly moose, apparently, that's at the camp. So, um, and then this is one of the worship sessions. It's, they have a cross that overlooks that whole valley, and uh, it's kind of one of the highlights of the camp where they can co- go up there and, and spend time worshiping and praying. And so um, sounds like it's going really well. They get back, uh, what, this afternoon, I think? So, um, yeah, yeah, good times. Be, be sure to pray for them as they finish out this morning. Um, no gig tonight, no, no youth group tonight, because uh, they're all going to be recouping from the weekend. So, um, all right, a couple other things. Tomorrow night, the Traveling Tabernacle. We've talked about this, how the LDS Church is putting on a Traveling Tabernacle, and it's, I've been through it. Um, I'm a history nerd. I invite all of you to become history nerds because life is fun as a history nerd because there's lessons everywhere. And so so the Old Testament Tabernacle, they have a recreation of it, obviously not, not the original one. Um, but it, we're going to actually, at 7 o'clock, it's just down on Pro- Pony Expressway, just into Eagle Mountain. There's like the, the amphitheater, and then there's the LDS Ward. It's in the parking lot up there. Um, so this is not tied to the church or anything like that, but we are going to be going through Um, and talking about all the symbolism, how the tabernacle pointed to Jesus. And if you guys were there, uh, some of you were there last Sunday night when I was actually able to talk in a um, devotional. Um, It's going to be a lot of the same things of that, but it's cool to see it in person and uh, how we don't want to miss the point. We want to see how it all points to Jesus. So that is tomorrow night at seven o'clock come as you are. You don't have to get sweatpants are fine. Um, in fact, encouraged maybe so. Um, but no, it's going to be super casual. Uh, you don't need a ticket. You don't need an RSVP. You can just show up. Um, and we'll have some fun time there. Um, and then Tuesday night, we have the men's baseball night. So if you want to go to that, Greenhouse is covering tickets because they're pretty cheap. Um, But just RSVP to me uh, by the end of today. I'm going to buy the tickets tomorrow morning. So if you're a Greenhouse dude and you want to come, just text me. Um, Concessions and everything like that's on your own. Um, I think we'll probably, uh, if you want to carpool, we can carpool from here and we'll let you know what time and everything like that. So uh, and then we have the women's apple picking on September 23 uh, from 1 to 3. You can RSVP on the link there. That's on our website, on our Facebook, on Instagram, everything like that if you want to RSV- RSVP to that. And then baptism, we are going to have another baptism on um, o- October 1. So we have several people who are already invi- interested in that. They're going to participate. So if you're interested in having an outward demonstration of an inward transformation that comes from Jesus, and uh, you want to just uh, let everybody know that, we're going to do it right out front here again. And uh, that worked out really well last time. So be sure and let me know if you're interested in that. And I think this is the last thing. Um, if you notice on a bunch of the seats, we have some incredible art from our very own Jordan right over here. And uh, so, yeah, so he just, he's kind of like, hey, is that okay if, if I just kind of bless people with some of this? Because artists want their art to connect with people. That's why God gave us the gifts that we did, whether it be uh, visual art or music or whatever it might be. But, but take that. Um, And I'd encourage, I just pray that it's a a blessing to you. I also pray that it's an encouragement just to pray for Jordan as he's taking a huge leap of faith um, in in launching into wanting to do this full time. And so if you want to be a part of his Kickstarter, how much time is left on that Kickstarter? 13 more days. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, be sure. And and all the information I think is on there. So, and, and talk to Jordan too. Like, Artists love to know when their art connects with people. So, so talk with him, and uh, he's a very, very gifted person, and it's fun to see people uh, use their gifts for the giver of those gifts. So um, I think that is it. Oh, and then if also if you want to follow um, us on Instagram or Facebook, here's some codes. Um, that's going to be scrolling and stuff like that. You can get on, subscribe, or whatever you do with socials. I don't know. I am such a boomer. I don't even know. So... So look at these fancy pictures. There you go. That's what I think. So there you go. But anyhow, um, 
Stay connected. I think one other thing, too, is I just really encourage you, um, get connected with people, right? That's what we're here for, Jesus. Love God and love people, and we want to serve the world. And so take a risk. Get to know somebody. How many of us are going to eat lunch afterwards today? If you're not raising your hand, you're not going to eat lunch today? (laughs) The beauty of how God made us is that we need food. And the beauty about food is that it's such a fun, natural time to connect. And so just just take a leap of faith and just say, hey, you got lunch plans today. Let's go out to eat somewhere, right? And so so just it's always fun when I hear about how people are connecting. Um, We can do that. We have great connect groups. Uh, It was really fun this week uh, to have all four connect groups this week. And so, um, yeah, so let's stay connected with that. So, all right, that's it. That's a lot. But we're going to pray, and then we'll continue to worship. God, we love you so much. We thank you for how you love us. You draw us to yourself. God, I thank you for each one that is here this morning. God, I thank you for those who are watching and listening online either this morning or later on. God, we want to experience you. We want to find you. Um, God, whether it be for the first time or in a new and deeper way, God, we love you. We thank you for being a living God, for giving us your spirit, that you're present in our lives. God, I thank you for your word, that we can, can know your heart for us and for your creation. God, that we can surrender ourselves to you We can allow you to live in and through us. God, I pray that you would fill us with your light and that that light would overflow. God, that we could experience what life in you is like and that we can share that. We can invite others into that as well. So God, that's why we're here. That's who we are. That's what we want to do. So God, this morning as we continue to worship and then dig into your word, God, just meet us. Speak to us. You're here. We're here. God, we just surrender ourselves to you. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, let's stand again together. Ryan's going to do in this next song. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, let the name of the Lord be praised. Both now and forevermore, all of heaven and earth proclaim, let the name of the Lord There's only one to glorify, Jesus Christ. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, let the name of the Lord be praised. Both now and forevermore, all of heaven and earth proclaim, let the name Let the name of the Lord be praised. 
scripture from uh, Philippians chapter 2. This Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave Jesus the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. the only one who could ever 
last week, that's this new song called The Goodness of Jesus. Um, there's a line that repeats in this uh, at the end of every verse. Uh, it says, rest here in his wondrous peace. There's a sense of peace that comes only from Jesus. As we dwell on him, as we realize his goodness and his love, there's a peace that he offers that's not going to be found any place else.
the name of salvation. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Hey, if you are elementary school age, you can head downstairs for some sprouts. We got a good crew down there, so... Awesome. All right. Hey, um, years ago, uh, a buddy of mine, um, he actually uh, is a pastor, but he also leads uh, service trips, mission trips. And they were in Ensenada, Mexico, and they were building houses in some of the colonias there. And, um, and he told this story about how uh, they had these families that came um, and they would come down and they would bring their whole family and, and they would spend the week building, building houses for people who, who didn't have a house, right? And uh, it was just awesome to see, you know, just the connections being made and just being the hands and feet of Jesus and just loving people in tangible ways and making a difference in their lives, right? And, uh, but there was one family that on the work site, uh, they, there was a, a stray dog that would always come by. And the, the, the family started uh, getting really attached to this dog. And they were like, oh, this cute puppy, you know, everything like that. And so they would play, and instead of working, they would, building a house for this family, they would play with the dog. And, and then the next day, they were like, hey, let's bring some of our extra food for the dog. And so, like, all week long, it was becoming more and more obsessive of how they could serve this dog. And they, they hatched this scheme of how can we get this dog back over the border with us because we're going to adopt this dog. We're going to save this dog's life. And, and it, was, it was, just became the focus. Like, that's all they could talk about at night. That's what they were just obsessed about, right? Well, on the last day when they were finishing up this house and... and um, you know, the family was coming and getting the keys to it and everything like that. And um, something happened. See, in the, in the colonies, they didn't have running water. And so they'd have these giant water trucks that would deliver water into containers at, at each of the houses, right? And they hear this, this gigantic water truck barreling down the street. And as they look out, they see their, 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 their prized possession, right? This dog come running across the street and get ran over by the water truck. Like, that's, that's terrible. I love dogs. Like, I just don't want that to happen to any dog. But, but still, it's like it happened, right? They lost it. They were devastated. They were like, our trip is ruined. How could a loving God let this happen to this poor, innocent dog? We were so close to saving this dog's life and giving it a whole new life with us. And, and like, they, their trip was ruined, and that's all they could talk about. Okay, I love dogs. I really, really love dogs. I love my dog, right? Um, but as far as like my dog or human beings, it's not even close, right? What was so sad is how often it, we, how easy it is for us to lose sight of what really matters, right? How often do we get consumed with self, what we want instead of others and what they need? Last week, we looked in the kingdom of Jesus's economy, how he values redemption, reconciliation, and restoration. This morning, we're going to see part two of heaven's economy. And it's this, is that the kingdom of Jesus values service over selfishness. We're going to be looking through the second half of chapter, uh, sorry, second half of Matthew 19. We're going to be going through 20. So join me in Matthew 19, verse 13. Starts off with this, Jesus, uh, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, let the children come to me, don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. Okay, last week we talked about this, right? We talked about how kids were viewed in that, in that day and time in that culture, and it wasn't really that good, right? Kids weren't worth very much. I was kind of actually doing a little bit of research again this week, and children were not considered fully human until they could walk or talk. Sorry, Lily. <laughs> hi, hi. 
you're going to be such a nice human being someday when you can walk and talk, right? Isn't that terrible? I feel like a horrible human being even saying that. But that was the, that was the culture. If you couldn't walk and talk, then you weren't really valuable. And what was crazy is that, um, um, uh, I, I think I said this last week, but a, but a father could literally get rid of a kid. I mean, even after they could walk or talk, I think until they were like in teenage years or where they could contribute to society or whatever, right? And so what you would happen a lot is especially with girl babies because girl babies wouldn't, wouldn't take on your family lineage and your line. Um, the dad would literally just go take this child and just go lay it out in the street or they would take it to the city dump. And what's really interesting is that the Christian church was actually renowned, the early Christian church was renowned for going dumpster diving for babies. If that's ever a, a statement, right? Like they put themselves on the line to go save babies from being killed. Like that, that, was, that was incredible to see because they weren't considered fully human yet, right? But they knew that there was value in the life of these children. One out of four kids died by the age of 12. You see, part of it was maybe a societal thing to where they just didn't view how, how, how you know, they were, they were human yet. Um, but some of it also was a mortality rate. Some of that was just, just like kids dying, right? But some of that was also parents throwing their kids away. 1% of infant burials were marked. Think about that. 99% of kids that died in infancy didn't even get any marking for their, for their graves. Archaeologists have kind of studied that. Um, just, just so incredibly sad, right? But yet Jesus starts off this passage today talking about these dependent, submissive, impressionable little human beings and how they matter to him. They're always learning, always growing, always maturing. They're vulnerable. They need guidance. These are all good traits. Not always valued by culture though, right? And then he continues in verse uh, 16. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. But, the, but to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man asked. And Jesus replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely. Honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What, what else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for he had many possessions. Okay, there's a lot going on here. But did you see what happened here? The man said, what must I do to have eternal life? Now that word have is the Greek word echo, which means get, obtain, earn. How does Jesus reply? He says, if you want to receive life, then do this. The word there is it's hard to pronounce, but it literally means to receive, to enter into as if at the end of a journey. And so the man is kind of saying, what laws must I obey? What, you tell me what I need to do. Give me the checklist. Give me all these things that I need to do. And Jesus says, if you want to receive a gift, you're not going to be able to earn the wage, right? If you want the wage of what you're going to earn, it's not going to be good for you. But if you want to receive what I have to give, this is how to do it. What's really interesting, though, is that he lists out six commandments. And some of them sound really familiar, right? It's really interesting of what Jesus says here. First of all, he, he talks about some from the Ten Commandments. Don't murder, that's commandment number six. Don't commit adultery, that's commandment number seven. Don't steal, that's commandment number eight. Tell the truth, that's commandment number nine. And then he goes back to number five, which is honor your father and your mother. Honor your parents, right? And then he adds on this interesting one, though, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's not in the Ten Commandments. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus is kind of like, kind of mishmashing all these. Where that command comes from is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And the beauty of it, even though he doesn't say number 10, love your neighbor as yourself, sums up commands number 5 through 10. And so it's kind of like, here's an example, here's an example, here's an example, and it's all under the umbrella of love your neighbor as yourself. 
Jesus, obviously, what are the two, what, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. He combines these two. And what's really telling, though, is what he doesn't say. He doesn't say commands one through four because all of those are about honoring God. Wait, to get into heaven, I have to honor God, right? So why did you tell me how to treat my neighbor? It's because if we don't love what God loves, do we really love God? Think about it. Jesus is kind of saying the proof is in the pudding. If you love your neighbor, if you're willing to treat your neighbor well, then you probably love me too. To love God means that we need to love what he loves. And it's kind of like him throwing down the gauntlet. You can say you love me, but if you don't love what I love, you don't really love me. It's very, very interesting at how Jesus handles this, right? For the man, it's all for, from, and by him. It's I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. So what do I get? For Jesus, it's give, and then you receive. It's not take, it's give and receive. And what's really interesting is that this guy knows it's not working. I've, come, I've, I've done all these commandments, right? And, and he says, I've loved my neighbor, but then, but then he says, what else must I do? And, and it kind of tells us he's done everything, but he still hasn't found what he's looking for, right? Like, like, he says, I've done all this, but yet I still feel like something's missing. And so he says, okay, this is what it means to love your neighbors yourself. Give all your riches away and go serve the poor and then follow me. And that's where the rubber hit the road for him. That's where he couldn't get past. He could not think about getting rid of everything that he had worked so hard to obtain for himself. And if it's either what I want, what I've earned, or Jesus, I'm going to go with what I want and what I earned, right? The thought of treasures on earth was greater than treasures in heaven for him. It was self over service. Then Jesus continues in verse uh, 23 through 26. He goes, Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they said. Jesus, at, Jesus looked at them and, intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God everything is possible. Okay, there's a lot of debate over this, right? There has been movements in the history of the world that says, if we have any possessions, we're not going to get heaven, so we're going to sell everything, right? I mean, that's, that's one way of interpreting it. But another way of interpreting it is saying, it's kind of hard for a self-made, self-sufficient person to want to give their life to Jesus. It's hard for someone to convert to following Jesus if life, if, if life is great on their own. What do I even need Jesus for, right? It's saying it's not impossible. It's just saying, logically speaking, it's hard because Jesus is calling us to a different type of kingdom, to a different type of, of standard of, of what is life about instead of more, 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 me, 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 me. It's sort of like, no, how do I leverage what God has entrusted me, the talents, the resources, the gifts, the, the finances, the whatever it might be, how do I leverage that on behalf of what God wants to do? He gave me those gifts. And so when God calls me to, to give $10 or $1,000 or $100,000 or an hour or a week or or, or my career, or whatever it might be, I'm going to do it because God gave it to me. I'm going to use it for him. It's his anyhow, right? So it's harder when we have that mindset, and I think that's really the core of what this passage is talking about. It's selfishness versus service. And he's saying it's really hard when we think it's all about me. It's from me, for me, through me, to me, by me, everything. I'm self-made, I'm independent, I'm self-sufficient. Why would I ever want to follow a guy that says, lay it all down, pick up your cross? It doesn't make sense, right? The, the gospel of Jesus and the cross is foolishness to a world that is obsessed with self. And that's why he says we need to be childlike. We need to be dependent. We need to be open. We need to be impressionable to Jesus and what he wants for us. And, and he also kind of says it's not impossible, it's possible through Jesus, but only through Jesus. 
Then he says in verse 27, then <laughs> actually he doesn't say, you got to love Peter here. Peter is a piece of work. I love this guy. He, he reminds me of a guy I know. Then Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What do we get? <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad. You guys don't understand my humor sometimes, but I'm glad you understand Jesus's humor. That's, that's so good. Peter literally in the face of what just said, well, we've given up everything. Give me mine, 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 right? It's sort of like, what in the world? What do we earn? And then Jesus says in verse 28, Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive, <clears throat> sorry, will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Do we seek our power, our safety, our security, our comfort, our glory on earth, or do we seek these things for Jesus for eternity? If we're on Jesus' side, then eternity's really good for us, Right? The past suffering, the trials, the, the times when things just aren't going, they will seem like a blip in eternity. We have to remember that perspective. It might not seem like I can take another step or another breath here on earth, but when we are in heaven with God, it's all going to be a testimony of God's faithfulness in us. So there's this phrase that I came across this week, forfeiting temporary rewards equals eternal rewards. Seeking temporary reward, rewards means that we're going to probably forfeit eternal rewards. Now, I don't want to get too stuck in this because I think that we can get kind of legalistic in it, right? Of, of well, I'm going to give all this stuff so that I can get a better spot in heaven. Then check our hearts. Check our hearts. That's not what he's saying here. But it's this logical thing. If we surrender to God, we are going to experience the fullness of life that he has us now and forever. Then we go into chapter 20. And, and Jesus tells this really interesting story about a farmer who goes out and he hires these workers to work in his vineyards, right? And he says, okay, I want you to do this job for, for today, and I'm going to give you this much money, right? That's a fair day's wage. And then at 9 a.m., he goes out and he finds some more people in the market and says, why aren't you working? Well, nobody's hired us yet. Well, you want to work for me? Yeah, sure, we'll come work for you. And then he does the same thing at noon, at 3 p.m., and at 5 p.m., and he says, hey, come and work for me, right? And then finally, at the end of the day, at 6 o'clock, he brings all of his workers together, and he's, he's handing out the cash for the day, right? And he goes to the people that were there at the beginning of the day, and here's your full day's pay. 9 a.m., here's your full day's pay. Noon, 3, 5, here's your full day's pay. And the ones that were there from the beginning are like, wait a minute, this isn't fair. Why do they get paid as much as we do? Like, this doesn't make sense. They didn't put in the work. And what's really interesting is that Jesus kind of heads this off in verse 15 and 16. He says, is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. The story isn't about how to earn our way to heaven. It's about the radical generosity and grace of God. It's the Savior that's dying on the cross and looks to the person next to him and says, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. And he says, I'm going to see you in a little bit in heaven, okay? I'll be right there. He wasn't baptized. He didn't pray a prayer. He didn't live a life of faithfulness and service. He didn't do all these things. No, 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 no. He gave his life to Jesus and recognized you are the only way to heaven. He goes, you get it. I'll see you there. Right? Now, we can be mad about that, or we can say, good, good. I'm glad that he didn't have to earn his way in, because that means that I don't have to earn my way in. I simply receive what Christ gives us. If we receive the goodness of God, we should also be excited when others receive the goodness of God. 
Jesus is actually kind of echoing what the Old Testament prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. It says, all of our self-righteous efforts are like filthy rags compared to the goodness of God. Too often we act entitled, like, no, this is me, this is me, instead of just saying, this is all God. Now remember, as we continue here in verse 17, Jesus has turned his face towards Jerusalem. He knows where he's going. He knows what he's doing. And he picks it up again here. He says, Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what he was going to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed and the, but to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged, with a whip and crucified, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. Jesus, this is the third time that Jesus lays out what's going to happen to him. Exactly what's going to happen. The third time, betrayed, mocked, beaten, killed, but then would rise again. Do they get it? Third time's a charm, maybe? Verse 20. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He said. She replied, In your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, on the right and on the, the other on the left. But isn't this, isn't this great? This is, this is beautiful. He literally just says, this is where we're going to Jerusalem. This is what's going to happen. Just want to let you guys know, so when I die and I'm buried, you're not freaking out, right? And the first thing out of their mouths is, Mom, Mom, go ask, go ask. Now, at first, I was kind of like, I've coached a lot over the years, and, and I, I had a 48-hour rule to where, like, do not talk to me until 48 hours after the game, because I coached on Saturday, I want to enjoy my Saturday night with my family, I want to enjoy church and my family on Sunday, and then Monday, then I'll put up with you, right? But I was like kind of getting these overbearing parent vibes of, okay, why didn't you play my son's? Why aren't they captains? Why, aren't they, why didn't they start? Why didn't they get more opportunity? Why weren't they this? You know? I was kind of like, oh my gosh, like, this is unreal. He literally is just saying, I'm going to die. And all she can think about is, yeah, but where are my sons going to be at? Right? But what's interesting, though, is that I was just studying it. They were saying that most likely these guys set their mom up to it. Because they've already been arguing, they've already been getting in trouble, and it's kind of like, hey, Jesus, what is this? like, shut up, dummies, right? <laughs> Guys, if we send our mom, he won't get mad at us. He'll, he'll put it on her. And on top of that, a lot of scholars believe that this woman is actually Jesus' aunt, or I'm a Midwestern aunt, okay? <laughs> Look at how they're conniving. Jesus is laying out how he would be the ultimate sacrifice. He was going to serve all of humanity, and they still think about themselves. That's what's on their mind. That's what's in their heart. They completely miss the point. They're tone deaf. They forget about Jesus' suffering, and all they can think about is their power, prestige, authority, privilege. Then in verse 22, Jesus responds, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup, and I have no right to say who will sit by my right or my left. My Father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. It's contagious. Jesus has just said this. Some people say, what about me? What about me? It starts a feeding frenzy, and Jesus specifically says, guys, that's not what it's about. I don't even get to say who's at my right or my left. I'm here to serve a greater purpose and then all the other 10 guys come in and say, well, what about me? What about me? What about me? Like, they're just, they don't get it. And what's crazy is that Jesus is talking about the same cup. A cup means what you're going to bear. What did Jesus pray in the garden to be released from? The cup, the cup of suffering that was ahead of him. He says, if it's possible, can you please remove this cup from me? But I want what you want. 
I want to do what you want me to do. And if that means take it, I'm going to take it gladly with joy because I know what it's about. And they're like, yeah, we can too, we can too, but who's going to be the greatest? It just goes around and around and around. The point is this, they miss the point. They miss the point because they get what they prayed for. Eleven, well, one disciple (laughs) kills himself because he betrays Jesus. Ten die as martyrs for their faith. And the only one to survive was the apostle, was, was the disciple John. And John died by himself in exile. But a lot of scholars even think that they tried to kill him by throwing him in a boiling pot of oil, but he got out and lived, right? That's crazy. And so when they say, yeah, we can handle it, we can handle it, I think at the end they did finally understand it when they saw Jesus resurrected. But at the time they were like, yeah, God, make me patient. You sure you want to pray for patience? Increase my faith. You sure you want to pray for increased faith? Help me to, to, to think outside of myself. You, you sure we want to pray for that? They think in the moment that it's all for them, but they don't realize the cost that it means to follow Jesus. He explains it then in um, verses 25 and 20, through 28. Jesus called them together and said this, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over the people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Instead of using people, Love people, value people, serve people, be different. I like the quote from the Life Application Study Bible. It says, God gives authority not for self-importance, ambition, respect, or even talent, but for useful service to God and his creation. The economy of the world is to grasp power, to hold on to it, to dominate others for what we want, And to use others for self, right? Promoting self at the expense of others. But Jesus is different. Jesus embraces his role as the sacrificial lamb because he is there to serve the world. He was willing to give up everything for others. And then this section closes out with a seemingly random story. Verse 29. As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them. But, the only, but they only shouted louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. When Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said, we want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them. Here he is again, feeling that gut level compassion for them and touched their eyes. Instantly, they could see. Then they followed him. Lord, son of David, that says a lot right there. One, we need a savior. We need a Lord. And we knew that that, we know from Old Testament prophecy that that would come as a son of David. They see that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting for their entire lives. What's crazy is you see the crowd like, shut up, shut up, stop saying this. Like, just let him go, right? And so, but they, they knew what they was right in front of them, and they would get louder and louder and louder until Jesus looks at them. And I love how he kind of puts the question to them. He goes, what do you want? What do you, what do you want me to do? And what is their one request? Help me to see. What's ironic is that they already do. They already do. They were blind, they were outcast, they were shunned, but they saw who Jesus was. They saw what all the religious elite, what all the experts of the law, what even some of Jesus' closest followers couldn't see, and they were blind. Now notice how this section started off with outcast little children who actually were fully dependent and outcast blind people who could actually see. I love how the writers of the Bible put things because here are these beautiful bookends that prove the point. We're going to set it up, we're going to teach it, and we're going to knock it down. 
What's worthless is actually dependent on Jesus and has value. What seems to be blind actually sees what most of the people who consider themselves experts could not see. I love this. So here's the big idea of the passage this morning. Seek Jesus. Sorry, Jesus seeks service, not selfishness. Jesus seeks service, not selfishness. Here's two big things that we can learn from this passage. Number one, seek humility and leave the glory to God. That's hard. I want to be recognized. I want to be told I do a good job. I want to be unique and and needed. I I want all these things, right? That's my flesh. As 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 a person who struggled with insecurity and people pleasing, it, it, it was like, ins- I remember, some of you remember that I said this a long time ago, but, but uh, I remember talking with a friend and I said, I don't struggle with pride. I'm insecure. And they were like, uh, insecurity is a very deceptive form of pride. Because if I'm prideful, it's all about me. If I'm insecure, it's, it's all about me, right? It's two sides of the same dangerous coin. But we're always jockeying for position, I mean, even in God's own kingdom, churches you would think would be immune to this, but yet it's where it happens a lot, is we want to have a special voice. We want to have our way. We want to compete for the glory that only belongs to Jesus. That's not a good place. If we're competing with Jesus, it's not somewhere where I want to be, right? Here's another angle of this, is seeking humility instead of glory and leaving the glory to God. How do I handle it when good things happen to other people? That kind of reveals where my heart's at. If I see other people succeeding and getting recognized and things like that, that kind of hits my insecurity. That kind of hits my glory seeking because I want to be recognized. I want this. I want that. And I have to come to to recognize that I haven't surrendered my pursuit of glory yet. I mean, I, I, I surrender it, but yet I still struggle with it. It's so funny that Rich read the verse this morning because uh, it's right here in my notes, Philippians 2, uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Before the other person. And the second thing is this, don't try to earn horizontally what has already been given vertically. If any of you are Paul David Tripp fans, New Morning Mercies, he says that all the time. Don't try to earn horizontally, I need this from you, I want this from you, I need you to do this, I, I want to, you know, we do this horizontally and Jesus is kind of like, oh, that's so cute, I already gave you all these gifts vertically. You can't earn them. You can't do these things to have. I've already given you the gift. Simply receive it. That that one has been really, for the last couple years, has really been kind of just ping-ponging around in my head and my heart, right? Can we receive the gifts that God gives us with an eternal perspective, or are we stuck thinking, no, but I wanted this, I wanted this, I wanted this. It's, it's funny, you know, like you have the, the kids, the Tatum's downstairs in the nursery, so I'm going to throw under the bus, but, but we were, we were, actually I'd forgotten about this story, and we were talking as a family about it the other day, and when she was younger, you know, poor girl had three older brothers, and they were always so perfectly sweet to her, um, and, and, uh, and I remember, I forget exactly how the story goes, but, but she had like, I think it was Monopoly money or something like that, like $20. And she goes, um, she goes Do you, here's the 20 She goes, no, I want your ones, all of your ones. And she got like three $1 bills instead of $20, right? Like, like she thought, no, I want, I want all the ones when she had all this other stuff. And that's why we were with God is we think, I want this, I want that, I'm going to earn for this, I'm going to get that. And Jesus is kind of like, but I have things that are so much more valuable. I have things that mean so much more that you don't even know about. We need to align our hearts, our minds, our action, our will to God's. We need to love what he loves, the way that he loves him. 
And the cool thing is, is that the result of surrendering ourselves is that we get life. We get freedom. We get peace. We get all the fruit of the Spirit, right? We get this life now, but also forever when we surrender our lives to God. So, moving from belief to action, from knowing to doing, we need to ask ourselves this one question. When I see a need, what do I do? When I see a need, do I... First thought that comes to my mind is, someone should pick that up. Someone should fix that. Can't someone change this? Someone really needs to do something about this. Is that our first response? Or do we say, okay, God, I see it. Can I meet it? God, how did you put me in this situation to be an agent of change, an agent of healing, an agent of transformation? How can I be your presence? How can I serve this person in this situation? Guys, that, if we have that type of an attitude, think about how our marriages change, our parenting changes, our work situations change, our neighborhood, the way that we interact with our, our, our community, our region, even our world. Instead of thinking somebody needs to do something about this, we say, God, how can you use me? How can you use me to be different? To serve you in your will, your heart, your desire in this situation. Let's not be like the family that lost sight of why they were there to serve a community, to serve a family in tangible ways because all they saw was that simple thing that they wanted and they missed the opportunity right in front of them. Let's not be like that, okay? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the fact that you, you, uh, you kind of call us out. Um, you kind of show the stubbornness of our heart. You show how we pursue what we want, and a lot of times it's at the expense of what you want. But God, I pray that this morning isn't, we don't leave like discouraged or frustrated or beat down or anything like that. Instead, God, you give us so many gifts. God, help us to open our eyes like these blind men who saw you for who you were, that knew that you could do what we never could. God, help us to be encouraged by that, to be inspired by that. God, if there's situations in our lives right now where we feel stuck, we feel like, Things can't change. God, I pray that we would just run to you, that we would say, God, all things are possible with you. We surrender this to you. God, I pray that we, we change our perspective, that we view the, the things, the opportunities, the resources in our lives as tools that you want to use in your scheme, in your plan, in your kingdom. God, soften our hearts. Help us to be receptive. God, we love you, and I thank you so much that you loved us first, that you gave your life as a sacrifice to serve and to save. God, help us to follow you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together again. I'm standing here with open arms I'm learning where my help comes from I'm singing like the battle's won I'm learning where my strength comes from Not by power, not by might by the Spirit of God, up to the heavens, I lift my eyes, fully surrender all of my life. I'm laughing in the face of Your perfect love is with me. I'm living in your victory. Cause heaven is surrounding me. Not by power, not by mind, by the Spirit of God. Up to the heavens, I lift my eyes. Oh.
that you've given us to to remember what you've called us to, to to embrace what you're offering and to let go of all of the things that we tend to focus on give us the the ability this week the power the the will to choose what you are offering us to have our eyes open to what's around us and the places you're calling us to serve you're going to choose by faith to surrender to what you have for us, to keep an eye uh, on your spirit, on the eternal, and to rest in what you have for us right here, right now. We pray it in your name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you, well, tomorrow night at the Tabernacle. Yes? Thank you. But he brought me in of his love for me, of his love for me. Who the sun sets free, who is free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Yes, he is.